Hello. I'm coming to you live from my dining room here. I um, wish I could be with you there at our, our gathering this morning. But um, I thought it was probably better for me to keep my uh, COVID cooties to myself here at home. So I trust this goes well as we record. Today's lesson is 2 Samuel chapters 13 and 14. And I'm going to take a guess here and assume that you didn't learn about these chapters in Sunday school. And that's probably good because this is difficult reading material. Our study guide uses the words devastating and barbaric to describe the events we're covering. Um, she explains that David's sins against um, Bathsheba and Uriah won't just be repeated by his family members, but will actually be exaggerated by them. So remember from last week, um, the prophet Nathan told David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. Um, David's uh, sin of murder actually was worthy of the death pen penalty. However, um, Nathan also told David that because of the utter contempt that David had shown for God when he committed that sin, um, that the sword will not depart from your household. So violence within his own family is the consequence for the wrongs he committed. And that's the focus um, for today's lesson. But um, hang in there. Even these painful stories are recorded in the Bible for a reason. And yes, we will could, we will encounter real darkness um, in these chapters, but the big picture of scripture um, doesn't allow darkness to have the last word, and that's good news. Okay, let's pray together before we start. Lord Jesus, we come to you to tell you that we love you. We worship you as our Lord and our Redeemer. You are the true light of the world who brings us out of darkness and into the light of salvation. Please teach us now through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So today's story starts with Amnon. Just to help you keep these names and people straight, there are six characters that we'll be um, hearing from today, Amnon, Jonadab, Tamar, David, Joab, and Absalom. So Amnon is David's oldest son. Um, he's the crown prince, and he grew up in the palace um, with his various siblings and, and half-siblings. It's not hard to imagine rivalries and what plays for the king's favor that would have taken place among these assorted wives and siblings. And Amnon first appears on the scene in chapter 13, mooning over his beautiful half-sister, Tamar. He claims to be in love with her, but verse 2 shows that she's only an object of his lust. Tamar was a virgin, and that would have meant that she spent her time in a different part of the palace from him, uh, from the men. Um, Amnon, it says, was frustrated because she was kept in this separate part. Um, because he couldn't do anything to her. Okay, that's an ominous statement, and that foreshadows what's to come. So Amnon has this cousin, Jonadab. These two young men are buddies. Um, Jonadab was likely older, you know, since David was like the younger of the, the siblings in his family. Um, these cousins, Jonadab, would have been older. But it says that Jonadab had a reputation for being a very shrewd man. It sounds like he lived in the royal household as well, or close by, because it implies that he sees Amnon every day. So when Amnon tells him why he's looking half sick every day, Jonadab immediately suggests trickery, trickery that even involves deceiving King David. So Amnon is told to pretend to be pitifully sick, so much so that his father, the king, will come to see him then, okay, Jonadab coaches Amnon that when his dad comes in, he's to request that Tamar come give him something to eat, something that she's prepared herself, so that I might watch her and then eat it from her hand, verse 6. Okay, so David sends word to Tamar to go and fix some food for Amnon, and Tamar follows through. She does exactly as the king, her father, asks her to do. 
The result is that Amnon sets things up so that um, he's able to dismiss the other servants and there's no one near then to hear Tamar's pleading cries that he not do this thing that should not be done in Israel. He rapes her and immediately all his so-called love for Tamar turns to hate and he yells at her to get up and get out. Well, Tamar pleads with him again, begging him not to do their, her this even greater wrong. She knows that if he doesn't take care of her at this point, that her life is ruined. She's going to be an outcast. Amnon's response to her begging is to call his servant and ask the servant to get this female thing out of his room and, and bar the door on her. So Tamar immediately goes into mourning, covering her head with ashes and, and tearing the beautiful robe that she wore. Her full brother, Absalom, finds her in this state and he quickly figures out that Amnon uh, is the reason. Rather, though, rather than taking her um, to their father, the king, Absalom tells her to be quiet and not take it to heart and that he's going to take care of things. But Tamar was right. She lived as a desolate woman, contaminated and barred from society for the rest of her life. So David's response when he hears this. David's response when he heard it, when he heard all this, he was furious. And then there's a period. Well, we want it to say, and, okay, he heard all this and he demanded that righteousness and that justice be done. He demanded that things be made right, but that didn't happen. Instead, the chapter goes on to say that Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad, but he hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister. The chapter then moves on to Absalom's plot for revenge. And for two years, huh, he lets that hatred simmer in him and he's just waiting for the perfect timing to get back. And then under the guise of a sheep shearing party, Absalom invites the king to his sheep shearing festivities. Well, somehow Absalom has had the intel that David won't come to the party. Absalom also somehow knows that David has basically forgotten the incident about Tamar. Um, it wouldn't be surprising, you know, if Absalom had some spies deep in the king's household. Anyway, David um, lets Amnon go in his place. That's what Absalom asks. And then the rest of the royal brothers just sort of tag along. Well, at the party, Absalom makes sure that Amnon gets lots of wine so that he just, you know, lets down his guard completely. And um, then Absalom orders his men uh, to kill his half-brother. Well, there's a panic that follows and the rest of the king's sons get out of there as fast as they can. Um, somehow things move kind of fast. Word reaches the palace that Absalom has struck down all the king's sons. But just as David and the household begin to weep and to mourn, their mourning is interrupted by none other than Jonadab of all people. Jonadab announces that only Amnon is dead, explaining that murdering Amnon has been Absalom's intent ever since Amnon raped his sister. Then Jonadab says, look, the king's sons are coming up the road. It happens just as I, your servant, have said. So we can kind of, I would say, um, derive from all of this that um, Jonadab liked being on the inside. He hung out with Amnon, the crown prince, until it looked like he was out of favor. And then he took up with Absalom and did his spying and deceitfulness uh, with Absalom. So um, Jonadab is despicable. Well, in all the hubbub, Absalom immediately goes into hiding, running to his maternal grandfather's household, which is outside of David's territory. Uh, when chapter 14 begins then, about, um, about three years have passed. And we learn that Joab, new character, Joab, the commander of the king's army, and also his nephew, can see that David has gotten over, gotten through his grief over Amnon's death. 
However, he notices that David continues to mourn for or, or, or think over and miss um, Absalom, his other son. So Joab has a plan. He recruits a wise woman to speak to David. And she's supposed to dress up like a woman who's been in mourning for a long time. And Joab gives her a story to use. It's like a parable. It's about one of her sons being in exile because he murdered his brother. So Joab's counting on a couple things here. He's counting on David showing mercy to that exiled son, um, granting him safe passage back home. Joab is also counting on David seeing the connection um, between this woman's story and his own son, Absalom. Well, David not only gets the point of the woman's story, but also figures out that Joab is the one that put her up to it. So Joab receives permission to go to Geshur and to retrieve Absalom, but David only partially restores Absalom. He, he gets to return to Jerusalem, but he's not allowed to really be part of the royal family and he's not allowed to see the king's face. It's only partial. Then we have these interesting verses um, in 25 to 27, which describes Absalom's extraordinary unblemished good looks and his abundant hair, which was a sign of vigor in Israel. And these verses kind of sound familiar because they remind us um, of how Saul's looks were praised and perhaps are bring, meant to bring to mind that Saul's good look, good looks didn't equate with, with good leadership at all. Well, in a fit of temper after this, about this incomplete recognition, um, Absalom finally sends his servants to, um, you know, this sounds logical, just burn Joab's barley field down. Um, Joab confronts him about it and Absalom complains that these drastic measures, you know, had to be carried out in order to really get Joab's attention. Um, so he wants Joab to go to King David. And in the end, King David summons Absalom. The son bows to his father and the king kisses him, which is a sign of full recognition um, within the royal family. He's welcomed back. So that's the story of chapters 13 and 14. What are we to glean from these passages? What should we be taking note of? Well, first, I'd like to talk about Tamar because she stands in shining contrast to the rest of the characters. She obeyed her father's wishes and tried to care for her sick brother. And when it became clear what Amnon was really up to, Tamar cried out and pleaded for righteousness. She pleaded for righteous actions that are required of a man of Israel. Tamar comes across to us then as the only righteous person in this story. You know, it's difficult to think about the terror and betrayal that Tamar lived through. And statistically, she's not alone. After reading these chapters a couple of times, um, I felt I should look up the statistics on rape and physical violence towards women in our own country. I'm not going to go into all of that. But suffice us to say that those statistics do represent an ugly reality in American society. There are certainly women listening to this lesson who have experienced physical violence and rape. And I believe that one of the reasons that God records this story of Tamar in scripture is that God does not sweep this sin under the rug and neither should we. So I'm gonna interject this. As women who follow Jesus, what can we do about violence against women? At the least, we can be people who recognize the reality, give voice and support to groups who minister to victims. On a personal level, if we know a woman who has been abused, we're called to lament with them, to help to make it right if there's um, ways for us to do that, and also to offer hope. Um, in reality, there may not be answers for why you or another woman has suffered like this. And um, sadly, there may not be full justice in this life. But there is healing and there is hope. 
Returning to the broader theme, these chapters surely show us the destructiveness of sin. Sin messes with our minds. It obscures reason, it obscures truth. You know, it was great a few weeks back to read about David in his glorious, um, God-dependent early years. Um, now, however, he seems to have a weaker view, even of his own authority and responsibility. He's lost that clear-sighted um, discernment that he had. We don't read of him in these chapters going to God for direction. And he definitely has a weak grasp of his fatherly responsibilities. The thing that comes to mind so often as I was reading this, why, oh, why didn't he correct Amnon? Amnon should have been exiled at the very least for what he did. But how could he correct Amnon for sexual misconduct? And how could he correct the murderer Absalom even when he, David, was guilty of the same sins? David's sins have left him weak within his own family. He seems to be morally compromised. The two brothers then are poster boys for sin come to fruition. Absalom will add treason to his list of sins and die for it. Later on, yet another son, Adonijah, will try to steal the throne and will be put to death for that. At the beginning of this lesson, I mentioned that darkness doesn't have the final word. Thank you, Jesus. David does falter, does he ever, but he turns again and he does, it said, at the end of his life, he rules in the fear of God. David finishes well. In fact, David's last recorded words are words of high praise to God, who is his rock and his stronghold, he says, and whom he takes refuge. David thanks God for caring for him, for bringing him through pain and suffering and into a spacious place. God also made a wonderful covenant with David that his kingdom would never end. And that a king will one day come from his line who will rule in righteousness and will heal the earth. And that king, of course, is King Jesus. Jesus, who does not leave his children ashamed and desolate. At the cross, God judged all sin, including the sin of those who harm his sons and his daughters. Jesus was raised from the dead, which means that the pain and abuses we suffered have no power no power that compares with Jesus coming justice. Darkness is defeated by light and one day everything will be set right. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we worship you as our true king. We live now in a fallen world where so many struggle with sin and the, the suffering that sin has caused. But we thank you, Lord, that you are holding us by the hand, leading us in spite of the confusion and strife we experience. Thank you that you remove the shame and the power of sin. Please keep us grounded in scripture. Please fill our hearts with wise compassion. And we pray all of this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. Thank you, and may God bless you as you go to your discussion time.